I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here uh, in Burlington, Vermont. I flew in this morning uh, from Durham, North Carolina, which is where I live. And when I arrived, it's nice to be able to look over the lake and got a chance to hook up with some friends who live here and got a chance to go out to Red Rocks Park. How many of you have been out to Red Rocks Park? Have you, nice, huh? Beautiful. If you haven't got a chance to go out to Red Rocks Park yet, you got to get out there as soon as possible. The leaves are beautiful. Um, and then I got a chance to watch the sunset over Champlain, uh, Lake Champlain. How many of you got a chance to look at that on a regular basis and get there, right? Just over the hill. And how many of you actually take a moment to look at that and say, I'm pretty lucky uh, in terms of where I go to school, in terms of the people that I'm surrounded by? Um, and the other thing that I'm really, really fired up about uh, is the fact that you are currently at a college who puts this on the front page of their website talking about who you are as students, right? That is the entrepreneurial mindset. And so when you respond to Shelley talking about whether or not you embrace the entrepreneurial not, not mindset or not, uh, only a handful of hands went up. And my hope is that by the end of our time together, I'll see a lot more hands up. But let me change the question a little bit, which is how many of you want to create an extraordinary life for yourselves? All right. All right. Let's see it much higher than that. So the question here is not necessarily whether you want to be an entrepreneur or not. The question is whether you want to live an extraordinary life or not. And by my calculations, uh, President <laughs> Finney, uh, in, in some discussions that I've had and I've seen some research on, there is a good chance that the majority of you are going to live to the time that you are 100 years old, right? That gives you 28,800 days to try and figure out what you're going to be doing with your life and how to make it extraordinary, and you should be starting right now. So the question that we embarked on when we first set out to write this book was we wanted to try and reshape what entrepreneurship was all about. As President Finney has suggested, I've had an opportunity to have a number of different entrepreneurial ventures over the course of my life. One of the things that I uh, started when I got back from Chile, uh, and the interesting thing about the, no the story there is that I headed off from this very comfortable job at CNN having no idea what I was going to do with my life. Just recognizing the fact that I didn't want to be behind a computer monitor writing about the world, I wanted to be out there shaping the world. I wanted to be up there making a difference in terms of how others could live and how I might be able to use the things that I've been provided in terms of my own education to go try and do something different. And I had no idea what that was going to look like. And when I arrived in Santiago, Chile, after uh, a lot of travel through Central and South America, I was interested in a couple of different things. I was interested in, one, how could we use, how could we use telecommunications for education development purposes? Um, so I was specifically interested in distance education. And I arrived in Santiago, Chile. Anybody ever been to Santiago, Chile before? No? There's, there's one over there. All right. Put it on your list. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. We can swap other places that you should go in your life, but certainly put Santiago, Chile in your list. And I fell in love with it, and I decided I wanted to stay there. And so I ended up knocking on the front door of the largest television network down there and asking them if they had thought about developing distance education programming. To which they responded, as a matter of fact, we're starting to think about it. Do you want a job? To which I responded, por supuesto. Right? Of course I want a job. This sounds like a great opportunity. I took that job, and then I walked around thinking, wow, this is the greatest thing in the world. What else am I going to do with my life? Uh, and I saw the fact that there were lots and lots of young people there, 30,000 young people to be specific, uh, at 30 universities across the, uh, across the city. And I realized uh, very shortly that the vast majority of the places that I was going to to try and find a cold beer looked like this, right? Bad lighting, bad beer. And I thought, there's got to be an opportunity in here somewhere. Uh, and so one thing led to another, and I ended up raising $40,000 of local investment. Uh, purely because I was driven by this idea of trying to create a place where we could bring artistic people together to try and provide a, a venue for live music and the arts seven nights a week. Right. Coming out of that experience and starting something like that, uh, I began to realize that there was, there was this great energy that came about from having 
a vision on, a, on the literal napkin that I had drawn this down on to be able to bring that to full fruition and actually start my own place to which I could invite my friends to come join me for a drink while we listen to music. There's nothing more satisfying than having your own place that you dreamed up that didn't exist before you got there, right? So let me ask you again, how many of you would like to have that kind of experience over the course of their lives? That's something that's powerful, right? That all of a sudden you realize that you are in control of your own destiny and that you can be very intentional about the way that you go about doing things. And while I was down in Santiago, Chile, uh, I ended up meeting somebody who became a mentor of mine. And here was a good life lesson. Is that, remember, I'm, I'm starting a bar. I'm feeling really good about myself. I just raised this money. Things were starting to come along. We had just painted this 4,000 square foot Victorian mansion bright yellow. Uh, and I was jetting around the city, and I would go meet with as many people as I possibly could. And I walked into this meeting uh, without doing the adequate amount of preparation, and I went into my pitch about what I was trying to do with this cultural hotspot in this one particular neighborhood in the community. And I finally took a breath, and I turned my attention back to the guy I was meeting with, and I asked him what he did. And he had started his own university. Right? So here I am thinking I'm hot stuff because I started starting my own bar. This guy had started his own university. And I began to realize that the sky was the limit in terms of being able to bring this entrepreneurial energy and drive it towards something that actually was going to make the difference, in this case, for 5,000 students that were now enrolled in his, in his university that he had started because he had a bold enough dream to be able to bring that to reality. And when I talked to him about what he called himself, he called himself a cultural entrepreneur. And for me, that was the connection of the dots. It brought my passion for education together with my passion for entrepreneurship, and I set off to to create the rest of my career around the idea of being an education entrepreneur. As I was uh, going about that path, I realized that I didn't have enough skills to be able to do the kinds of things I wanted to do in terms of being an entrepreneur. And so I realized that I needed to go back and hone those skills in graduate school. Uh, so I returned to the States. It was a very hard decision to sell my bar, sold my bar, came back to the States to do a master's in public policy with a focus in education and an MBA. Because I felt like I needed the skill sets to really be able to take my energy to another level and be able to kind of create the change that I was interested in creating. Because I now saw from this mentor that I uh, had in Santiago, Chile, that that was possible. That it was possible to see that you could create your own university and actually make that happen by sheer force of will, vision, persuasiveness, resourcefulness, and action, and having the courage to go after it. And what I also realized is that I didn't think that we were uh, taking that message to enough young people in the world to help them realize that they themselves could follow this entrepreneurial path, that they themselves could be the leaders of their own lives. And so I started a small nonprofit organization teaching leadership and entrepreneurship to high school students. And as I realized while I was teaching the high school students that entrepreneurship was not about creating your own enterprise, necessarily. Nor is it necessarily about social impact, but it's a philosophy. It's a mindset. That the entrepreneurial way of being, the intentionality that it means to be an entrepreneur, means that you can actually take a set of ideas and drive them forward and make the world your own and live life on purpose. And so the more that I spent time talking to these high school students, the more that I was talking to students like you uh, and other emerging leaders who are about to set out in the world and set the world on fire, the more that I realized that we need to be able to tell that story and talk more about it and introduce a new language around this idea of the entrepreneurial mindset, which is what ultimately led to the creation of this book. And so when we were writing the book, we thought that there was it was important for us to talk about a couple of different things that ultimately we're talking about an evolving understanding of what entrepreneurship was all about. A place where you're not just responding to opportunities, but a place where you're actually creating them. And so what we saw is that we're actually trying to flip this from the idea of creating an enterprise, and yes, creating enterprises are fun and, and very rewarding, but at the same time, you should be entrepreneurial in everything that you do, in every facet of your life. And we'll talk more about this over the course of the presentation. So what we're trying to do is be able to drive this conversation from business entrepreneurship, which is, business, which is entrepreneurship 
to social entrepreneurship, which is how do you take that same entrepreneurial mindset and drive it towards social change? And this is the program that I run at Duke. So I run the undergraduate social entrepreneurship program at Duke to actually trying to bring it to entrepreneurship 3.0, which is this idea of life entrepreneurship. How do you bring this same entrepreneurial mindset into every facet of life? When we talk about the entrepreneurial mindset, these are the kinds of things we talk about. So when you talk about somebody who's entrepreneurial, right, you talk about somebody who ultimately is visionary, who has a high amount of energy to th throw themselves into whatever it is they have a passion for pursuing, right? They're highly innovative. They're constantly looking for new ways to change things, to create things, to push things forward, because they realize the fact that the world is not perfect and that we can always improve the world. There are always opportunities to be able to step up and make a difference in this world and create something new that people will value. And that entrepreneurs are somebody who are able to take it from this vision of what the possibilities are to a plan for execution and are willing to bring the resources around them to be able to make that happen and have the courage to take action and make that leap to go after it. So if you look at this list right there, that's very consistent with the people that you may know as entrepreneurs, the two entrepreneurs that you're going to hear from uh, in a little bit. But you should also look at this list and say, what on this list do you not want to have in your life? Right? Why would you not want to be the owner of your life? Why would you not want to have a strong vision of where you want to go? Why would you not want to continue to innovate and create along the way? and push yourself to think in new and creative ways about every new opportunity and every new day that you pass through, right? Why would you not want to take a, a, a moment to reflect on what the risks are, figure out how to mitigate against those risks, and take action regardless of those risks to be able to pursue something higher than yourself? Why would you not want to do that, right? Is there anything on that list that you wouldn't want to do? There's lots of things I know we could add to the list, and we should talk about that in the, in the, uh, the Q&A session in the workshop tomorrow. But if you believe this, then you can say, yes, that applies to my own professional path, but it could also apply to my own personal life. Because you should be taking the same amount of ownership and creativity and mobilization and action and courageous uh, risk taking in your personal life that you do as your professional life. And so this is the whole point here. And why is this important now? Why is it important that you read a book like Life Entrepreneurs? Why has uh, President Finney and, and Champlain College brought me here? Why is the LEAD program here so important? The LEAD program is important because you have so many pressures around you not to follow the entrepreneurial path. How many of you right now feel a pressure to pursue a path that you're not necessarily comfortable with? Just a handful of you? I'm curious about that response. How many of you feel like you're actually, you still know sort of that, uh, that you're, you're comfortable in the path that you're going down right now? All right, glad to hear it. It's good, uh, good to see. And I'm hoping that you stay that way because I'll tell you that I felt the same way in your shoes when I was a sophomore in college. But you know why I ended up at CNN? Because it was the safe thing to do. And it was because that was what it was expected of me. And what you'll find is that as you get closer to graduation, those pressures are going to increase. And as you get farther in life, those pressures are going to increase. There's a lot of pressure around you at any step of the way to conform to a particular societal image of who you are as a person. So it's great to be in the position you are right now, which is feeling like you have a good sense of where you want to go and that you have the courage to be able to pursue that path. Remind yourself of that on a regular basis. And don't follow the first path that is necessarily thrown in front of you because it's easy. Because we see so many people do that. I see so many students of mine that I work with at Duke that all of a sudden get panicked. The economy's tanking, and all of a sudden a job is thrown their way that has benefits. And though the job itself has nothing to do with their passions, or is not aligned with their strengths, or doesn't align with their values, they're going to pursue it. And they're going to pursue it because it's got benefits, not because it's something they're passionate about. Don't let that happen to you. Figure out the second, third, or fourth path. Figure out a way that you can integrate those, those two things. Figure out a way that you can get to a place that fulfills your needs, but also is able to fulfill your passions. 
and get you to a place where you really feel fired up and passionate about everything that you do every day. That's the, that's the direction you should be heading. And importantly, as you go, and this is what we see consistently among people that we work with, is that you're comparing yourself not by what you're contributing to the world around you, but actually how you compare to those around you. And that's the comparative ethic, right? Somebody is doing something like buying a new car or doing something special. It's hard for you to feel good or it's hard for me to feel good about that because I compare myself to them. Um, rather than just looking inwardly and say, am I on the right path for myself? So how do you get from the comparative ethic to the contributive ethic? And I do think that this is important, uh, with it, especially within this college context, especially you guys are just past midterms now. Midterms right now, all right. So this is particularly relevant. All right, but just, that's a great, great timing of uh, throwing me into a Sunday night talk, right? Right, what, are you guys going to mid midterms? Perfect. All right, right now, like, I, I just need to like, dig myself out of a hole on this one, figuring out that you guys like, oh man, you guys are gonna keep me here until 9.30 on a Sunday night, I got midterms? All right, so I'm gonna try and keep this as lively as possible and try and get you out of here in a reasonable time. But burnout is important. And the burnout, paying attention to burnout is important and figuring out a way that you can constantly renew along the way and get those blinders off of you and pay attention to the direction you're heading. And this is also important, which is the difference between compartmentalizing and integrating. How can you live an integrated life? If you remember from our tagline for our book, it's stories and strategies for integrating life, work, and purpose. Often, people tend to look at different things where they say, okay, I'm this person at school, I'm this person with my family, I'm this person with my friends. And that can lead to a very schizophrenic lifestyle. So the question becomes, how do you bring those things together? And how do you not postpone happiness? And how do you stay on track? How do you start living right now, today, recognizing the fact there are 938 days before you graduate? How do you make tomorrow matter? How do you make sure that you stay happy the next day? Those are the questions that we're going to try and challenge you with. All right. Here's the fundamental premise of the book, right? It's the difference between simply living a life and leading a life. And breaking out of that status quo, breaking out of the pressures that are around you, and figuring out a way that you can live a life in a very intentional, purposeful way. Ultimately, how do you want to lead? This is consistent with the message and question that you're getting every day from Champlain College. And it may sound simple right now, but as you get ready to take that diploma and walk off that stage into the, uh, uh, into the horizon, into the Burlington uh, Lake Champlain horizon and sunset, what is that going to look like for you? How do you want to lead? What kind of difference do you want to make in your life? What's your legacy going to be? What are people going to say when you die at 100 years old, when you look back and, and say, what kind of difference did this person make? And how do you start answering that question today? So we asked that question to 55 people, right? We wanted to figure out, of all these people who we know had actually come out of relatively ordinary backgrounds, how did they make various decisions along the way? I know you don't have this figured out yet. None of these people had it figured out yet when they first embarked upon their own path. The question is, how did they make various decisions along the way that got them to the place where they had created Starbucks or Cliff Bar or had become the mayor of Newark? How did, those, how did they make those decisions? What were the common characteristics that you saw in people like Cory Booker, right? Or Gary Erickson from Cliff Bar, or Howard Schultz from Starbucks? What did that look like for them? You know, Howard Schultz came out of the projects. Now he's CEO and chairman of the, one of the largest companies in the world. How did that happen? How do you make decisions about that? That is not accidental. That is purposeful. These people have had very purposeful, intentional ways of living. And we're trying to figure out how they did that. How do you live a life much more intentionally? How do you start walking down that entrepreneurial life path so that you too can live an extraordinary life? And you read the book, you recognize the fact that there are, it's full of stories. If you haven't gotten a chance to get all the way through the book, go back to it. There are some really inspiring stories in there that each one of these people had walked because each one of your life paths are obviously unique. Each one of their life paths are unique. But they teach us an enormous amount about what the future can hold in store. And the more that we take ownership of that right now and start acting like an, a life entrepreneur, the more that we can start moving towards a very extraordinary future for ourselves. 
All right, so what did we learn talking to these 55 folks? And remember, they, like, figuring that out, we had talked to each one of them for about two hours. We had over 1,000 pages of transcripts. So what were the key messages that we heard again and again and again coming from the people that we thought were really making an extraordinary impact in the world? One, they had a clear sense of who they were. They had spent some time in reflection figuring out some of those core identity questions. Two, they were really awake to the opportunities around them. Right? They were deeply attuned to the world, its changing context, and figuring out where they could fit in and how those opportunities aligned with what they were most passionate about and what they were good at and what aligned with their values. And they had a very clear sense of what the, what the future held in store. You know, I think we're going to have a great uh, conversation here uh, a little bit later about how a vision led to the creation of an extraordinary life, an extraordinary business. It's having a strong sense of what that vision holds in store. So it's A, understanding who you are, B, understanding where you want to go, and then C, it's connecting the dots and figuring out how you're going to get there. So the big difference between a dreamer and an entrepreneur is that the entrepreneur has a game plan, has developed the goals and strategies for figuring it out, and is able to marshal the resources and build a healthy support network around them to help him or her see that vision through to reality. And then finally, they're willing to take that leap and have the courage to go after it and have the courage to fail along the way. And then finally, they're able to pick their head up every once in a while and take a breath and keep themselves on track by making sure they didn't burn out. Right? So these are the key elements that you need to take away from this in terms of the entrepreneurial life path. And again, you should look at this and say, is there anything that you disagree with? Is there anything that you think doesn't make sense? We challenged this in terms of the 55 interviews that we had with people. And we saw to a person that each one of them was able to entail had a piece of this built into their own life story, which is the reason we write the book about it, which is the reason we talk about it, which is the reason why we work to try and help you engage in this conversation and develop your own entrepreneurial life, life plan, life path. All right, so I'm going to work through each one of these relatively quickly, and then we can have some Q&A about it. And again, there's a workshop tomorrow for those who actually want to start working more deeply into this entrepreneurial life path for yourself. Because you shouldn't just be listening to this in an abstract way. You should be always thinking to yourself, how does this re relate to me, right? So when I look at this core identity question, it's not, OK, let me just look up that on the screen. It's saying, OK, what, what's my history? Where am I coming from? What do, my, what do the stories of my parents tell me about who I am? What do the stories about my grandparents tell me about who I am? From my people. What have been the things in my life who, that have been formative learning experience, good or bad? And have you ever shared those with anybody? Because if you can learn from your history, you can figure out how you can take elements and lessons from that history and be able to strengthen your, your path going forward. History should inform but not confine. The other thing is, what are your circumstances right now? Yeah, you're sophomores at, uh, at Champlain College. That's great. You obviously have done a great job being able to get to where you are right now, but some of that's on your own steam and some of it's not. How do you start recognizing the fact that in 938 days, your circumstances are going to change? And how do you take full advantage of that circumstance? The fact that you, at this stage of the game, may have certain student loans. We'll talk about that in a second with regards to needs. And you may have certain needs in your life, but you are in a prime place in your life to be able to take risk, to be able to push horizons, get out of your comfort zone, try new things. Take the limited amount of money you've got and go to Santiago, Chile, or go to South Africa, or go to China. If you're not out there, out in the world, you'll never know the kinds of opportunities that are around you, right? Your circumstances are right now that you are more free and more privileged than 99% of the rest of the world. What are you going to do with that? And where do you have in your life relationships that are going to push you farther and harder than you have ever thought to push yourself? And what are the relationships in your life that are going to try and hold you back? And do you know the difference? Are you spending more time paying attention to the people that are going to push you and get you out of your comfort zone and have you try new things than people that will say, whoa, that's uncomfortable for me, therefore I don't want you to go do that? Relationships can be empowering. They can also be debilitating. Just recognize that. 
And then what are the internal influences of your core identity? Again, ask yourself these same kinds of questions. And we'll be dealing with this in, in our mini workshop tomorrow. Uh, for those who want to get into this conversation, uh, you may just want to go back to the book. You may just want to take a journal and go spend some time walking around Lake Champlain and thinking about these things. But what are you passionate about? What are you truly passionate about? What could you, could, what could you not live with? And what could you not live with five years from now? And how do you make sure that your life is not void of those passions? And then also, what are you good at? Make sure you're not spending too much time on your weaknesses. Make sure that you're time leveraging your strengths. Figuring out a way that you can figure out what you're really good at and do that as often as you possibly can. I stink at a bunch of stuff, right? What I stink at is I stink at details. I hate accounting. I don't like finance. I don't like operations. I don't like to balance my checkbook. I don't like any of that stuff. What I like to do is get people fired up. I like to have people uh, see a vision for the future, and I like to drive towards that. So you know what I do? I partner with people who are good at the operations. And so every single company I've started, I start with somebody who's good at operations, because I hate doing that stuff. And it allows me to do the stuff that I'm good at. How do you make sure that you're surrounding, you're surrounding yourself by people who are better at you at some things and allow you to really thrive in your own strengths? And then finally, and this is important, uh, because I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, what are your needs? Right? Have you run a budget to understand exactly what your financial needs are? And my guess is that your financial needs are a lot less than you think they are. And that gives you a heck of a lot of freedom. Because if you can figure out exactly what your financial needs are, here, now, and going forward, then it will give you enough empowerment to know how far you can push your bounds. Every single time I've started a new company, I've recognized exactly what our needs are. And my needs have increased, right? I now have, uh, I'm married, I've got two young children, we have a mortgage, we've got a couple cars. There are certain financial needs that I have. And writing a book is not a way to get rich, I promise. Um, and so when you're writing a book like this, you're, putting, you're pouring a lot of your passion into it, but you also have to recognize the fact that you're going to take a major hit financially. So how much could I, of a hit financially could I take? You run the numbers on that, and then what I do is I actually have a, uh, a consulting business that I can keep <coughs> cooking along that gives me the time and flexibility necessary to be able to make money, do the things I'm passionate about in that regard, but also free up time to, to start building a new company, write a book, whatever it may be. That same kind of financial flexibility gives you a lot of leverage in terms of what you want to do. One of the people that we talked to was Seth Goldman. You guys know the, uh, the company Honest Tea? Familiar with it? When Seth started Honest Tea, uh, it was a huge leap of faith for him because he had a wife and two children. And he recognized the fact that it was never going to be a good time to start a business, especially an a iced tea company, right? But he, he, he felt like there was a need in the marketplace. He had enough passion, knew that he wanted to be the master of his own destiny. And so he brewed up this tea with a professor of his from Yale. So they had worked together back at business school, and he thought that this was a good opportunity. So he brewed this literally in his kitchen sink, brewing this tea, coming up with the right concoction. And he brought it to, this is a great side story, and I'll go back to why it fits the needs question in a second. He brought it to Whole Foods, right? Do you guys know Whole Foods? Uh, and Whole Foods said, pretty good idea. We don't have anything like this in our category. We want 15,000 bottles in a week. So here he had a thermos of this stuff, and he had to figure out how to go from a thermos full to 15,000 bottles in a week. And when a Whole Foods says they want 15,000 bottles, you don't say, uh, can you give me a month? You say, OK, we'll get it to you in a week. And he busted his butt to try and do that, and he got it done. And then from there on out, he's been able to grow this very, very successful company. For the first few years, though, Seth continued to drive a really beat up 1999 Saturn. And why did he do that? He did that because it gave him enough financial flexibility so that if everything tanked with honest tea, he and his family would still be OK. Recognize the fact that you do have financial needs, but needs are different than wants. If you guys get yourself into a situation where you are uh, feeding the appetite of wants, you're going to get yourself into a very tricky and very inflexible situation. And that's why we got ourselves into this economic mess in the first place. But if you end up with your costs being way more than you can handle, then you're in a very, very tough situation because it's going to be difficult for you to go follow the passions that you have because you need to go find a way that you can maximize your paycheck. So just take that into consideration.
If you're thinking about these two, th these two circles here, right, in terms of the external factors and the internal factors, the external factors being history, circumstances, and relationships, and the internal factors being uh, passions, need, strengths, and needs, you recognize the fact that these can begin to inform your values and ultimately your purpose. And that spending time on these core identity questions actually gets you to a place where you have a much clearer sense, or you should have a much clearer sense, of the kinds of things that you ultimately want to pursue and the kinds of opportunities that you're looking for. Because at the end of the day, there are all these opportunities that are popping up regularly. And as Champlain College students, you're going to have more opportunities coming your way than you have the time to pursue. So the question becomes, which opportunities do you ultimately pursue? And are you ready for them? So there's a great quote in our book from Carlos Castaneda, but he talks basically about the difference between the normal person and the warrior. And that the warrior, when they see that square centimeter of chance present itself, have the speed and the prowess to pick it up. How do you make sure that you're living life not on the balls of your feet, on the heels of your feet, but on your toes, ready to see that new opportunity? Because opportunities come and they go, and opportunity windows close with relationships, with new professional opportunities, with new friendships, with new travel opportunities. And how do you make sure that when that opportunity presents itself, you're ready? So the more time that you spend thinking about what, you, what it is that really clicks for you, and the more time you can begin to evaluate what kinds of opportunities make sense. How do you run it through a selection matrix? How do you run it through an opp opportunity to say, is this aligned with my values? Does this fit where I want to go in my future life? Is this something that actually fulfills my needs? If you haven't done that pre-prep homework, then when that opportunity presents itself, by the time you figure it all out, that opportunity may be gone. Let me give you a quick story, which I, which I love, and some of you might, might have heard from my past talk here. One of my favorite quotes, uh, for favorite stories from the book uh, is Paul Nizrani. So Paul grew up in a farm. And at the end of the day, uh, on this farm, he would go make ice cream with his family. And so he always had this dream of having his own ice cream company. Now, ice cream company sounds like a great idea when you're 10. But when you're in college, all of a sudden, ice cream co company sounds like a terrible idea, right? Because it's a childhood dream, something that you shouldn't be paying attention to. In fact, what sounds like a much better idea is to go become a certified public accountant, which is exactly what Paul did. And it goes back to the idea that he was getting pressure from a lot of different quarters in his life, including his own pressure on himself to go follow the path of the CPA. Not to discredit the CPAs in this world that are passionate about it, but Paul wasn't passionate about being a CPA. But he always harbored this idea of having his own ice cream company, right? So much to the fact that he actually would go and write down the various uh, costs of running his own ice cream company, et cetera. So one day, he's working. It's a Sunday. You can almost imagine the green eye shades. He's in New York City. And he goes off to lunch, and he's coming back from lunch, and he goes by his favorite ice cream store. And this favorite ice cream store is going out of business. And they are having a very shady auction of all their things on the corner on that particular day on Sunday in New York City, cash only. And he's done enough homework to recognize the fact that the industrial-sized ice cream maker that they had available was at a screaming deal. Only $3,000 cash. And so he felt like God was talking to him. It's like, Paul, it is time to start your ice cream company. And so he goes to every ATM, ATM machine he can find, pulls out $3,000 worth of cash, and goes and buys this industrial size ice cream maker. And he's pushing it down 42nd Street saying, what in the hell have I just done with my, you know, my savings and my time and my life, pushing this 800-pound industrial size ice cream maker down, uh, down 42nd Street? But that became the catalyst for him to seize this new opportunity, have the speed and the prowess to pick it up, and he's now started a very successful regional ice cream company called Adirondack Creamery. Some of you guys may have eaten it, because it actually, I think, services uh, Burlington, Vermont. The great part of that story is that a week after he bought this industrial sized ice cream maker, he went on a blind date. And the woman was so taken with the fact that he had just spontaneously bought this industrial sized ice cream maker that he, she immediately fell in love with him, and now they have two kids. Right. You can imagine what would have happened had he been a frustrated accountant at that moment in time. Right? 
You, if you pursue your passions, good things will come. And when you pursue those opportunities as they present themselves, good things will come, right? Be on your toes. Be ready for that square centimeter of chance. And also, start thinking about what this future holds in store, right? If I were to sit down with, uh, with you on an, uh, on an airplane, and I would say, so, Marissa, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. And you say, well, I'm a sophomore at Champlain College. Right? Probably what would generate is, oh, where's Champlain College? Oh, it's in Burlington, Vermont. Wow, I bet Burlington, Vermont gets really cold at winter. And then you'll start talking about how much this person doesn't like the cold and spends most of their time in Florida. Right? And you've missed a perfect opportunity to have a robust and interesting and rich conversation with this person. Rather, if Marissa says, I'm a sophomore at Champlain College, I'm a writer, I love to write, I'm interested in potentially starting my own blog one day about women in politics. I'm just making it up, Marissa. That all of a sudden, the imagination gets sparked, right? Because all of a sudden, that person next to her may say, oh, I know somebody who has her own blog. Oh, I know somebody in politics that you should get connected to. And by the end of that plane ride, you should have four, no four names of people that might be able to open new doors to you. This goes into the idea of having an articulate vision of where you're going and who you are, right? To put this into very real context, I raised $10,000 in an airplane one time. If you can figure out a way to be able to give them a pitch about a big idea that you're interested in, something that you're excited about, people will listen and they'll get behind it. So the question was, what should that vision statement hold in store? Often we ask and encourage people to pay attention to what, what's 10 years out look like for you? Make it far enough away so that it's not being constrained by your current circumstances, by your current present. So what does 10 years look like for you? How do you start answering Richard Leiter and David Shapiro's work on what is your vision for the good life? They talk about the good life as being living in a place that you love, surrounded by the people that you love, doing the things that you love. What does that look like 10 years from now? What does this look like when you're 30? If I were to come up and knock on your front door 10 years from now in an ideal circumstance, putting your wildest dreams out there, what would it look like? Where would I find you? Where would I find you 10 years from now? Where would you most like to be? I'm pointing to you in the white shirt. You. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Japan and a gaming company, fantastic. All right, where would you like to be in 10 years? Yeah, you. Okay, working with any company, having a di your own digital editing, where? But where, physically? Big dreams, anywhere, anywhere you wanted to be. DC, all right. I know, I see, I, I was in DC. I know all, people, all sorts of people I could connect you with. The point is, is that if you sit down next to that person on an airplane, what's your vision? What's your vision statement? How are you going to unleash that curiosity and sense of opportunity and possibility? Because once you have a vision statement, you can begin to develop some very clear goals and strategies for how to get there, right? Because again, this is the entrepreneurial path. It goes from having a clear sense of what your vision looks like, figuring out the gap analysis. Okay, you're here right now, point A, Champlain College, sophomore in Champlain College. You wanna be in DC running your own digital editing company. What do you need to be doing? You need to be, you wanna be in Japan running your own gaming company. Okay, what is that gonna take for you to get from here to there? Who do you need to start getting connected to? What kinds of very specific goals do you need to set yourself for the next three months, six months, one year, three years? What do those goals look like for you? And how do you start making sure that they are, as we put out here, purposeful and prioritized? How do you make sure that you're spending time the way you should be spending time? One of the things that we work with people on is a time mapping exercise. So you can actually begin to say, how aligned is my time and the way that I'm spending it right now in keeping with what my vision is for where I want to be going, in keeping with my passions? Am I spending time in the most effective way possible? Make sure that things are purposeful and prioritized in that goal setting mode. The other thing is make sure that they actually are clear enough that you can measure your progress against them. So again, if you have a very specific set of goals for yourself, how do you make sure that you're not only writing them down, but you're sharing them, and then you can hold yourself accountable, and other people can hold you accountable for it? And then finally, how do you make sure that you're swinging for it a little bit? 
Make sure that they're challenging but achievable. Because once you have those goals lined up and you see sort of how you want to be starting to do things in a very regular order, then you can actually begin to develop some strategies behind that. Okay, I know that I want to connect with five people in the next six months who are related to the gaming industry in Japan. And I know that by the time I, want, I graduate, I want to have a two-year internship with a gaming company in Asia. What do I need to know between here and there to be able to make that happen? What are my strategies for making that happen, right? And then once you figure out that, how do you start surrounding yourself by people who can get you through that process of thinking it through and holding you accountable? And that comes down to creating healthy support systems. This is the idea of creating your own personal board of directors, right? We all have board of directors for various enterprises that we start. How do you have a personal board of directors that you can count on? And what are the characteristics and dynamics of a healthy support network, of a board of directors that you can really go to, right? There are three characteristics that we see are most powerful and most dynamic. One is the people in that support network have to have a deep and trusting and authentic relationship with you and you with them. Because you're going to need to share things with them, dreams, goals, vulnerabilities, that you know they're not going to laugh at you about. That they're going to pick you up and help you get there all the way through. The other piece, which is really important here, especially looking at this audience, is that you've got to start talking about diversity. And not just diversity in terms of the normal ways we talk about diversity, racially, gender, et cetera, but actually diversity of perspective. How do you make sure you're surrounding yourself by people who can expand your horizons, open up new doors to you, and challenge you on certain things just when you think you've got everything figured out? The best people who I go to when I have a tough decision are my mentors, who tend to be one or two generations older than me and people who have very different life experiences and I know are going to call me out if I'm heading in the wrong direction because I have a deep and trusting relationship with them and because they have a different perspective on things. And sometimes I'll disagree with them, which is great, but at least they're challenging me on it. How do you make sure that the people that you're surrounding yourself by are giving you that diversity of perspective? And then how are you paying it forward? How are you paying close attention to the fact that your buddy wants to start a gaming company in Japan and you want to start a blog talking about women in politics? How do you help each other get there? One of the best things you can do in this community is develop a peer leadership group that can help support you in that path, support you in those goals. And how do you make sure that you're doing it for each other along the way? This is not a narcissistic approach, right? This is a pursuit of trying to help each other out and lift the water so that all boats rise. And then once you've got this all put into place, right? Once you have a clear sense of who you are, once you have a sense of what the opportunities look like, once you have a sense of what your vision looks like going forward, once you have the goals and strategies in place and your healthy support network around you, what's holding you back? Nothing should be holding you back. But what do you think does hold you back? What holds you back? Fear. Fear of? Failing. All right, so let's break that down, right? That is definitely the number one thing that holds people back. But what people don't take into consideration is the fact that what is the worst thing that can happen to you if you take a swing at something and you fall? What happens? Yeah, you hit the ground, right? And what happens? You get back up and keep moving, right? Dust yourself off. Do you guys know, know who Mark Warner is? Anybody know who Mark Warner is? Ski, he's a skier. He's, I think there might be a skier named Mark Warner. There's, a, uh, there's also a senator named Mark Warner in Virginia uh, who is a former governor. And here's an interesting story about Mark Warner. So I went and talked to Mark Warner about his own path. First in his family to go to high school. Uh, sorry, first in his family to go to college. Does well in college, goes off to Harvard Law School. Um, family has very, very few means. And they all think that Mark Warner is going to go off and make a mint of money in New York because they had no money from where the family that he came from. But he decided to pursue his, po his passion. His passion was politics. He moved to D.C. and he got a job as a fundraiser for the Democratic National Committee, making $17,000 a year. Very, very little money, but fit his needs. 
And he recognizes the fact that he's raising the most, the most amount of his money from entrepreneurs, people who have done some really interesting things in their life. And he recognizes the fact that he himself wants to be the master of his own destiny and goes off to start his own company. Takes all of his life savings, blows off his college loans, and takes a swing at it. Six months starting his company, he fails. Fails badly. Uh, bankrupts the company, loses all of his savings, picks himself up, starts another company. Six weeks later, that one fails. This stage of the game, he'd been kicked out of his apartment, sleeping on his friend's couch. The normal person at this stage of the game would have said, I'm hanging it up. I'm going to New York. I'm going to go make a bunch of money. But his friends around him, his healthy support network with a diverse set of perspectives said, Mark, in you taking this passion and this courage to be able to go start your own companies and your passion for politics, it would be wasted by you going and running this normal status quo path. We think that you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And there are a couple things that are starting to come down the pike right now that you should be aware of. Again, recognizing the fact that you need a diverse perspective, diverse relationships, bringing things back. The first is that they were auctioning off, about to auction off a bunch of cell phone licenses uh, up on Capitol Hill. This is the early 80s. He was able to get that tip because he knew a bunch of people in DC because he'd gone off and done a bunch of fundraising then, built, building relationships and building people who trusted him, liked him, and wanted to help him out, right? So he starts thinking about it in the early 80s and say, someday, some people might start using cell phones. And the second thing was they said, not only uh, is this a good opportunity, but we think we know somebody who might be interested in your story and might be an investor in your company. And so they set him up with a meeting with a guy who was a self-made entrepreneur up in Connecticut. This guy liked the fact that Mark Warner had failed twice before starting his third company, that within 30 minutes he invested a million dollars in Mark Warner to go buy these cell phone licenses. One thing led to another, and that was the beginning of the company Nextel. Right? And when you talk to Mark Warner, the first thing he wants to talk to you about is failing. Now when you look at that, it's so easy to say, yeah, but that guy's Mark Warner, right? He's a senator from Virginia. He was former governor. He started Nextel. How does that have anything to do with me? This is a guy whose nobody in his family had gone to college before then, right? There's nothing that makes him different than you. The beginning of his journey was the same as yours. How do you figure out that path in life? And how do you make sure that you recognize the fact that failure, swinging for something, and the cost of failure is often buoyed by the value of the experience that comes along with it. And what is often not taken into consideration is the cost of regret. And I can tell you from talking to lots and lots of people and experiencing this myself, that regret is a very, very heavy cost. It's far heavier than the cost of failure. So when you're taking into consideration the fear of failure, recognizing the fact that you should also be most fearful of regret and not wanting to live a life of regret. And the guy who's in that photo, his name's Eric Weinmeier. Eric Weinmeier has climbed the highest seven peaks in the world, including Mount Everest twice, I think. He's a paraglider, and he's blind. Right? If this guy can figure out how to climb Mount Everest blind, there's nothing that should be holding you back from trying to figure out whatever you want to do and making it happen. And as you take that action, make sure that you recognize the fact that it's more than just about you. It's about how you can serve. And not just serve in the way that we traditionally think of service in terms of volunteering in a soup kitchen, because Kyle will recognize this in, in this conversation. It's how do you make a habit of service? And how do you make it a habit of excellence so that you walk every day like you're serving others, that you're paying it forward every day, because you have the opportunity to be extraordinary. And being extraordinary means giving back as well. And then it's this idea of being able to take uh, the time every once in a while and recognizing the fact that you can push and you can try and you can swing for it all the time, but eventually you need to be quiet. You need to be able, able to build in these daily renewal rituals so that you can be able to get a breath of fresh air and get some perspective on things. The nice thing about the, the rest of this quote is, uh, and by the way, John Gardner, uh, it was an extraordinary uh, individual who was, uh, uh, well, I'm not even going to get into his bio, but he's one of these guys who 
you would not expect to say, be quiet. You would read his bio and say, did that guy ever stop? Did that guy ever sleep? And yet, he puts the most amount of emphasis on this idea of renewal. And the reason why is this. Following this quote, he says, you'll be surprised how the world keeps on revolving without your pushing it. And you'll be surprised how much stronger you are the next time you decide to push. If you can take that breath and you can get away from the burnout, especially as you go into midterms, recognizing the fact that you've got to push hard now, but when you're done pushing, let up. Go for a walk. Get a break. And then come back and you'll be stronger the next time. All right, I'm going to wrap up here in terms of these ideas. The life entrepreneur ultimately is somebody who has very strong drive and direction. Consistently, this is what we hear from people. Where you are in your life right now is my guess is you have a lot of drive and you're start, starting to think about what your direction looks like. And so the question becomes, how do you go from being a seeker with strong drive, but you should authentically have lots of questions around your direction? If you've got it all figured out right now, my guess is you're not being open enough to the possibilities. But eventually, through a process of reflection and preparation and action, you can begin to pull it into that captain's box and keep it in that captain's box on a regular basis. Recognize the fact that life changes all the time. Circumstances change all the time. So the more that you're equipped with knowing how to ask the right questions, the more that you can actually keep yourself in this idea of both being both driven and having a clear sense of what the direction looks like. And recognizing the fact that you have to be a warrior and a sage in this, in this path, in this life path that we have. The ancients used to talk about this idea of the importance of vida activa and vida contempliva. Contempliva, contem contemplativa. And the, the com contemplativa is the, con the contemplation, right? It's the sage, it's the quiet, it's the reflection. And then the warrior is somebody who's willing to go out and make a strike and figure out how to make it happen and bring all that ferocious tenacity to be able to make it uh, to make the world a different place and a different place. How do you keep those two things uh, in balance with one another? Because ultimately, there is a big dividing line, right? There's a big dividing line between the ordinary life and the extraordinary life. The question is, how can you have that extraordinary life? How can you live consistently with the fact that all of you raised your hands and talked about wanting to create an extraordinary life? What does that look like for you? And what you realize in talking to people who have gone off and done those kinds of things is that the very first step is deciding that you want to create an extraordinary life. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. All right, so I think we we got time for a couple of questions. Uh, anybody want to throw a couple of questions at me? I will remind you just uh, just quickly that uh, a I'm going to be hanging out and signing books uh, and happy to have conversations at that point. Uh, two is that there's a workshop at 3:30 uh, uh, tomorrow, and that'll be. All right, you'll hear more information about that. So if you want to work through some of these questions with me tomorrow afternoon, I'd love to do that with you as well. Um, but in the meantime, why don't you throw a couple questions my way if you've got any. Besides, how do you balance more than six books over there? Six. I was kind of weak. I bet you can get eight. Weak. All right. Who's got, uh, who's got, there you go. There you go. That's what I like to see. Pushing your boundaries, getting out of your comfort zone. While he's, uh, while, he's, while he's organizing that, anybody have any questions? Are you you're that incurious? There you go. All right, well done. Give that guy another book. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, Okay, as far it's, as it's, let's respect each other. As far as um, college goes and, and classes so far, and you know, getting into college, there's been a lot of emphasis on the diverse student, the student who, you know, can be good at one thing but 
it's really the person who focuses on their weaknesses and brings those up to par that really exceeds in the business world, in the collegiate world, things like that. And I'm, I'm wondering, you said, you know, I focused on my strengths and I got someone else that was good at what I wasn't good at and partner with them. And I was just curious, at what point did you really, do you really realize like, okay, I'm not that great at this. I'm going to focus on what I'm good at and I'm going to take that as far as it can go. Like, is there a, a point where you just decide that you're going to go with what you're good at? It was when I started becoming in control of my own destiny. So when I, so in my job at CNN, I was, I was given a lot of res responsibilities and tasks and stuff I wasn't very good at. And as a result, I was mediocre at my job. And when I stepped out and started doing the things that I was really wanted to do, I realized that in order for me to be successful in terms of my own entrepreneurial life path, I couldn't focus my energies on the stuff that I wasn't very good at because A, it would, make, it would probably weaken my own entrepreneurial venture that I was trying to start, and it would, drive, it would make me less happy. Uh, and so it was at that moment that I began to shift things. Interestingly enough, we actually do a fair amount of work with companies helping them to think about how they can create uh, an organization that truly leverages people's strengths. And if you, as you're thinking about the kinds of organizations you want to work in, you want to be thinking about organizations that respect that and understand what you're good at and put you in a position where you can succeed rather than setting up you up where you'll fail. Um, so that's one of the things to take into consideration as you're interviewing for jobs, as you're talking to various organizations, make sure that they understand not just they want to just fit you round peg into square hole, but rather how do they make sure that you're, you're, you're going to be in a position where you can really knock the cover off the ball, uh, which will just make you that much more successful. There's a great book uh, out there. Uh, you might be familiar with the, the books Good to Great and Built to Last. There's actually a book called Built to Last in Life, I think, or something like that by Jerry Porras. Uh, and he talks about the fact that people who are really successful in jobs are the ones that are really passionate about what they're doing and are able to leverage those strengths entirely. Because if you're not really passionate about what you're doing, somebody that is going to be competing for you in that job is going to be more passionate than you are, and they'll beat you at it every time. And so making sure that you're doing things that you're passionate about is not just going to make you happier, but it's going to make you stronger in, in terms of higher performance. Another question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, most of us kind of have our hands tied by college loans. You'd mentioned that the founder of Nextel had sort of blown those off when he uh, got out of college and went into, you know, pursuing his dreams. Uh, how does one how does one manage that? <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> very irresponsibly. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, what he'll say is that you know he he was able to c carry that. Uh, for the few months that he was going for these particular things, you have to understand where your, where your limits are, where your financial limits are, where it becomes irresponsible. Now, I will say that I've seen people do this again and again and again with college loans in particular, which is if you are creative enough, resourceful enough, and smart enough and visionary enough, you can usually get people that are going to pick up those loans if you have a strong enough vision of where you want to go. Let me give you an example of that, which is that increasingly service organizations that can provide you with an exceptional learning experience, you can also waive your college loans or actually get them repaid through service. Um, so Peace Corps, for example, will be an opportunity. Uh, Teach for America, I think, is an opportunity around that. There are several different opportunities that are out there which actually are designed to give you a, an exceptional leadership development experience while also getting you in a position where you can begin to forgive your loans or at least postpone them while you, get under your, while you get your feet under you. But even with that, you have to recognize the fact that your financial loans probably are still surmountable and you don't have to take a job just for the paycheck, but you can get a job that you really are passionate about and still cover those college loans. That's the most important lesson coming out of it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. One last question. All right, we got a great program coming up, so I'll turn it over to Shelley. Thank you very much. <laughs>